who will have one more talk, which is by Julio Bermudez, who spoke two years ago to us. Julio is associate professor at the Catholic University of America, the School of Architecture and Planning. Um, he will be talking about architecturally induced contemplative states. Julio. Okay, guys, it's very late, so I'm sure if you are still up for this, I'll try to be on time. Can you turn it off a second so I could... It's okay. It's an honor to be here, and um, I want to start by uh, thanking for uh, people to invite me, uh, but I wanted to say just one thing. Just before, before I was born, uh, I'm from Argentina, as you can hear, um, my mother and many people in Argentina were escaping the polio epidemic, and my mother was the first group of mothers that received the polio vaccine, and uh, I grew up from very little hearing my mother's talk about how much we own Jonas Salk. So I uh, want to thank uh, the sons for, for that and everybody else. Thank you. Long ago, we discovered that if we articulate it, worship buildings could evoke the sublime by inducing meditative states. This has long been self-evident for the architectural profession. But it's close to impossible to demonstrate empirically. The arrival of neuroscience and brain imaging for the first time in human history provides us with a non-ambiguous way to match psychological states directly to the neural correlates. Scientifically, the question is posed this way. Can an external method to induce contemplation architecture produce neurophenomenological results similar to those attained using conventional, that is internal, self-directed methods such as uh, meditation or prayer? This is a novel question because one, the vast majority of neuroscience studies have centered on internally induced meditation. This is because such method can be easily and successfully implemented in the strict confines of the lab. And as a result, insufficient attention has gone to investigate externally induced contemplative states in neuroscience. And second, it is also novel because it's, uh, despite its obvious relation to aesthetics, contemplative states have not been looked by neuroaesthetics. Instead, neuroaesthetics has been concerned with aesthetic judgment, which is by far not contemplative. In short, this work that I'm sharing with you is both, hopefully will contribute to both areas. With this in mind, we conducted an fMRI study that looked at the functional neuroanatomical difference between engaging contemplative buildings versus ordinary or non-contemplative buildings. Our experiment, Block B, consisted in showing subjects visual images of five buildings set to, con to induce contemplative states. We used two controls. Our first control, Block A, came from showing the same subjects images of five ordinary buildings not designed to elicit contemplative responses. The other control came from the neuroscience literature uh, covering subjects either undergoing meditation or seeing aesthetic objects. We recruited 12 subjects for the experiment. Choosing architects as subjects follow a rational similar to selecting expert meditators to demonstrate the power of meditation in the laboratory. In our case, architects are most likely to have the strongest and therefore measurable responses to buildings than the average citizen. I remember it's a pilot study with limited budget, so that's why it's limited to these type of uh, subjects. 
Protocol-wise, participants were instructed to imagine being transported to the building shown in the images and just be present on that place and situation and let the experience be whatever it may be. There were two questionnaires. One was given after each block and consisted of three self-assessment questions addressing level of anxiety, presentness, and internal dialogues or, or mind wandering. The second questionnaire was done after finishing the fMRI study, was 20 minutes long, and included questions, 15 minutes long, and included questions about a variety of issues that you could see here in the slide. Let us now move to the results. First, in terms of self-assessment, contemplative buildings were found to significantly, significantly reduce anxiety and mind wandering, a result consistent with moving from an ordinary mental state to one of meditation. A visual summary of the responses to four questions of the exit questionnaire show unmistakable distinction between control and experiment, demonstrating that during contemplative buildings, subjects arrived to a state of mind that was aesthetic and contemplative. Respond to another four exit questions were used to map the type of attention deployed during each block. As we can see, there is again very obvious differences. Whereas the control block elicited a distracted and inwardly directed attention that is consistent with high level of anxiety and mind wandering, the experiment overwhelmingly provoked absorbed and outwardly focused conscious states consistent with high concentration and aesthetic appreciation. Let us now move to the fMRI studies uh, for the results. Let me say that except for this and the very last slide I'm gonna show, um, um, all our new results I'm gonna, I'm gonna show today, um, I show some of this uh, on 2012, uh, other type of results. In this first exhibit, we present the activation of the whole brain in comparison to the baseline. Control and experiment blocks show similar and even overlapping acti activated areas corresponding to premotor functions and um, visual processing. While there are some differences, what matters here are the commonalities, as they emphasize what is unique to the architecture experience in general, vision and embodiment. That is an embodied, perceptual, and motor state of awareness and being. These results are also consistent with neuroaesthetics of painting and sculpture. A contrast analysis of whole brain activation between control and experiment presents activation of the middle frontal gyrus and the right cerebellum during the control, a reasonable outcome to, res to respond uh, uh, to buildings uh, or that are ordinary or co common, like office, a school, or a shopping mall, that demand a social cultural code of behavior vis-a-vis -vis spatial, material, or formal cues. Subject needed to activate executive function to make go and no go direct de decisions based on what, when, and where of the scene. In contrast, the experiment show a different activation of the left and right parietal lobes. This suggests a synthetic integration of multiple senses that may be associated with the aesthetic experience. And given the lesser frontal uh, cortex activation in comparison to the control, may account for less mind wandering and, and, and outwardly directed attention reported in the um, exit questionnaire. We'll now briefly follow this finding by looking uh, at the prefrontal cortex and the inferior parietal lobe in more detail. A, a closer look to the, uh, of the prefrontal cortex have confirmed its relative lack of activation during the experiment versus the control. Comparatively, the prefrontal cortex is silent during the experience of contemplative buildings. This is consistent with meditative states when self-narrative activities, that is the mind wandering, analysis, evaluation, judgment, dependent on the frontal lobe are basically shut down, what the West considered great uh, mind is shut down. But we are seeing much less activation than we would expect, even on the internally induced uh, contemplation. We must remember that traditional meditation depends on engaging still the prefrontal cortex to regulate the deployment and the maintenance of attention. Anybody that have tried meditation knows that you have to keep coming back. In our case, the power of the stimulus, our architecture, attains the same effect, that is, at keeping attention and interest without demanding the subject any effort. Regarding the inferior parietal law, we verify its differential and balance activation during the experiment. As said, given this region's central role in integrating, in integrating somatosensory neurological activity, 
as well as certain aspects of attention and holding a sense of body and environment, this result suggests a more comprehensive, synthetic, and attentive engagement of the experience than the control. This interpretation is consistent with the sense of atmosphere, wholeness, and totality the subject reported in the exit interview. Let us now uh, consider anxiety and mind-wandering vis-a-vis architecture. We expected that anxiety would narrow down awareness and raise negative feelings. It would turn attention inwardly to the psychology of the self and away from the images and the architecture, thus fostering internal dialogue and distraction. In other words, anxiety would remove the person from the experience. This is exactly what happened in the control. Anxiety seems to block the proper activation of the uh, Borman area uh, six, uh, the premotor function associated with agency, diminishing a person's ability to properly plan and execute complex coordinated movement. Similarly, the stressful state weakened the place recognition area, interferes with the synchronization and integration of multiple sensory perception, and subverts the association of emotional saliency, uh, the insula here. Since the brain areas being affected are important for the architectural experience, anxiety weakens the architectural experience in general and undermines the possibility of attaining contemplative states in ordinary buildings. Something odd happened when we consider the role of anxiety in contemplative buildings. Looking at the positive regression on the top, we find that the activation of the claustrum and the primary visual cortex, the problem in area 17, increases as rating of anxiety increases. This seems to go against what we expect. A stressful situation should actually break down the synchronization and integration of sensory information and probably diminish visual attention and activation due to the rational articulated a second ago. What is happening? Before answering, let's consider the negative correlation findings on the bottom. During the experiment, anxiety, anxiety reduces emotional processing and motivational engagement, the singular region of BA25, and also reduces conscious spatial processing and attention along reflective awareness, BA7, thus subverti subverting at some level self-directed contemplation. However, one would expect a lot more disturbance, probably at a more fundamental level, that is in areas more central to the architectural experience like we saw in the control. To respond to this apparent failure of anxiety to undermine the architectural experience, we could say that the power of this building is such that their experience not only survive as, sort of survives anxiety, but in fact calls for a high level of synchronization and integration of sensory information. In other words, the architecture induces a contemplative state that soothes the subject's stress by directing their attention more intently to the beautiful spaces in front of them. Nothing new, really. After all, isn't this why we often go to a church or a museum or a garden to calm ourselves or to the, to the, garden, to the, to the courier? Our research provides neuroscience evidence of the power that design environments may um, have on people. Turning now to uh, internal dialogue, we expected that like anxiety, mind wandering would interfere with both the experience of architecture and the onset of contemplative states. This, is, this latter is something well known in neuroscience and meditative traditions. In the control, the more mind wandering, the less spatial processing, attention, and reflective awareness, BA7, as well less activation of the reward seeking uh, and motor planning mechanism, the substantia nigra. The fact of making the, a full architectural experience is very, very difficult. In the experiment, internal dialogue inhibited the scenic engagement, a diminished conscious spatial processing and attention, while interfering with sensory motor processing and consciousness, in, in particular the thalamus. Notice the internal dialogue was much more damaging than anxiety to the experiment. The positive correlation of the premotor as somatosens somatosensory centers dealing with embodiment could make sense following a logic similar to the one argued earlier with anxiety. The more we are in our heads, the more our motor and somatosensory processing must be activated in order to respond to a situation that we feel compelled to appreciate even if our mind tempts us to wander, as in the, is in the case of the experiment. The last result I'll share with you today um, 
shows, uh, um, makes the, the, the neuroscientific case for an architecture-induced contemplative state all the more compelling, at least I believe so. Based on a subject response to all our questions and using the parameters listed in this slide, we ranked our subjects' depths of experience. The ranking goes from subjects having a very superficial and intellectual response to the experiment to very, very deep, absorbed, and emotional experiences, some even non-dual. What we, want to see, what we wanted to see was if there was a, any correlation between this variability in phenomenological response and brain activation. Using such ranking of subject, we did a regression analysis and found a progressive and massive down-regulation of the brain the deeper the contemplative state. Specifically, the more profound the architecture experience, the more awe, um, the, the, less, the less activation of the prefrontal cortex associated with executive function, sense of self, analysis, and so on, less activation of the posterior cingulate gyros considered a central component of the default mode network of the brain, along with the precuneus and the, um, and the prefrontal cortex, less activation of the superior temporal gyros, which deal with, uh, of course, auditory experiences, visual association area dealing with uh, labeling, understanding, and even the inferior parietal lobe. At the same time of this massive deactivation, there is an upregulation of area associated with sensory motor operations supporting the ascetic absorption with the stimulus. In conclusion, first, contemplative buildings elicit neurocorrelates of meditative states that are both like and unlike those using, gain using internal induced states. Second, unlike traditional meditation, architectural induced contemplation is an aesthetic state that activates neural regions of sensory integration, non-criticality, emotion, and embodiment. I didn't show parts of non-criticality and emotion, but you could uh, see my, my talk in 2012 about that. But similar to ordinary meditative methods, contemplative buildings do cause, do, do cause significant reduction of mind wandering and anxiety, along with an increase in attention and the deepening of the experience. Third, there are significant neurophenomenological differences between contemplative and non-contemplative buildings that could be compared to different, the difference between meditative and non-meditative states. And fourth and last, since the architectural stimuli was a central cause for these responses, it is clear that the quality of architectural design does matter, and matter a lot. Thank you. <laughs>